Okay, this is, this is why I've, been, I've titled this lesson a little as much as God is in it. The book of Philemon. You, you, you look at this book and, and it's like, well, it's a great story. Here, here's a, a, what seems to be a, a slave or indentured servant, depending on the version you're reading, and he's, he's, he's run away. And, and there's this story there. It's a personal letter. And, and we know that the Bible is all about the story of Jesus. And, and so you, you, you look at it, and, and, and I ask myself the question, why, why is this letter included in the canon of Scripture? It, it just doesn't, of all the things, especially letters we know that Paul wrote, why not a third Corinthian letter that we suspect he wrote? Why not that? Why Philemon? So I got to asking myself that question, and something jumped out at me that was just remarkable. It was a life-changing moment in my perspective of Scripture, specifically this letter, and I love this letter. You probably have already figured it out. I'm, I'm of the type that when I figure something out, other folks have already thought about it and dismissed it. But it, it really meant something for me, and, and so I wanted to share that with you. So what we're going to do... Thank you. You know, that's a great idea, Velcro on the podium. Brings a whole other meaning to scriptures that stick to you. <laughs> ah, okay. Here's what I want us to get out of this lesson. I want us to think about how we can encourage one another. You know, as, as sojourners, we, we have two missions, really. Uh, we, we, we want to evangelize however we do it, but we also want to encourage people and encourage congregations. And, and so that's what we do, right? Isn't that what Paul told us? Don't forsake the assembly encourage one another, all of those things. So that's what I want us to do. I want us to learn how we can encourage one another through this letter. It's a great letter. I also want us to think about how much God loves us. No matter how insignificant, how little we might think we are, I'm old, I can still pray, I'm young, I can learn, I can grow and develop and be a great servant for the Lord. That's just so much. Uh, and it, God demonstrates his love through us or to us through so many different ways. And, and so that's what I want us to get out of this letter. I want us to be able to answer the question, why is this letter there? What's in it for me? There's nothing wrong with looking at scripture and say, what's in it for me? God wrote it for us. And so what's in it for us? So we're going to look at that. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Tell you the truth, my lesson plan that I'm using is um, 11 pages long. Typically, um, I cover about six pages in an hour. So I'm going to try to move through it in the interest of, what is the old saying? The mind can absorb only what the seat can endure. <laughs> so I'm going to move through it. Let's start about uh, talking about those. Some ob oh, I wanted to show a little bit of a geography lesson, where in the world these things took place in, in history. As you can see on the map here, uh, Paul is in Rome. And uh, I think I may have jumped a slide. Hang on. I did. Let me, let me hold off on the geography lesson just a second. This letter was written by Paul. There are actually some people who dispute that Paul wrote the letter. I, I think they're kind of like um, I, I was in graduate school. You're, you're looking for something unique to write about. And so some of these theologians were in graduate school and they said, I know what I'll do. I'll write a paper disputing that Paul wrote Philemon. Because I can't imagine anybody really seriously thinking Paul did not write this letter. He wrote it in around A.D. 60 or 61, the same time period uh, that the letter of Colossians. It is a companion letter to the letter of Colossians, as we know. The church has been established now for about 30 years at the point of this writing of the letter. Give or take, but it's about that. This letter, it's a personal letter. It's written from a Christian brother to a Christian brother or about a Christian brother. So we're really dipping into somebody's personal letter. This is not necessarily what we would think of Paul's writing as a pastoral letter or a chastisement letter, that, that sort of thing. This is a personal plea from Paul. All the more reason when you look at it, you think, okay, it's a great letter. Why is it here? What's in it? Something's there. And so it's not only a doctrinal letter, it is a doctrinal letter when you think about it, but uh, it is a personal letter. We'll look at that later. But it's specifically written to an individual about a serious issue, but we're reading someone's mail when we're reading this. So Paul's under house arrest in Rome, and uh, he's being ministered to by several individuals, one of which is Onesimus, the runaway slave from Philemon, uh, to whom the letter's written. All right, here's what I wanted to show on this slide. It is roughly... 
uh, close to 1,000 miles. Uh, the uh, map that I got this off of said 1,500 kilometers, 932 miles. It's interesting, uh, I did a real quick check on Google Maps and from my house to here is 774 miles from uh, my home in Prattville, Alabama to Choctaw, Alabama. It's 10 hours and 49 minutes. And I don't like to, but I could drive that in one day. We didn't, we went to Camp B and then drove up here, but uh, down in, in Marshall, Texas. But anyway, we had it interstate part of the way, I want to say part of the way, I was using map, or a Goop, excuse me, uh, my GPS, and coming up here, it took me way somewhere in the backwoods, over to Antlers. <laughs> By the way, there's a wonderful little restaurant there, it's called Midnight Bakery. If you were going through there, it was a great little place to eat. I know the eating places, if nothing else. But think about this, Onesimus didn't jump in the Ford F-250 pickup truck he might have had and drive up the interstate. This guy had to not only travel that long distance through some pretty manual ways, but think about it, he's a runaway slave. He's got to do it quietly and secretly. I have no idea how long it took him to make that trip or how arduous that journey was, but he found himself in Rome. Uh, and and uh, so there he was. It's an incredible distance to travel for that time period if you wanted to or by normal means, but for him to do it hiding and all of that, it's really something to think about. That line, that 932 miles, as uh, Billy likes to say, that's as the crow flies. He didn't go that way. He would have wound all through there and maybe spent a period of time somewhere. So, so that, that line is 932 miles. I, I can't imagine that's all he traveled, much further than that. Uh, it would have been several months, perhaps a year or so longer to go the distance. Uh, we don't know how Onesimus traveled, uh, but he came to know Paul somehow. It's, it's possible that since Paul and Philemon were acquaintances that Onesimus knew him or knew of him. Let me put it that way. But uh, what we do know is that Onesimus and Paul became close. Paul administered, I mean, uh, Onesimus ministered to him. Uh, he was now a faithful brother in, in Christ. And that changes everything. That changes everything. Everything. So either way, all throughout the region, uh, I think people would have been aware of who Onesimus was, uh, his situation to some extent, and who he was now. It's also likely that Philemon was aware that Onesimus was now with Paul. It, 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 so it's very possible that, that he knew that, uh, was there with Paul. Now that's speculation on my part, but given the closeness of the relationship with Paul and Philemon, I'm, I'm drawing that conclusion. He, he, that's a freebie. So we read in Colossians chapter four, uh, seven through nine, we see Paul sent two letters by Onesimus with another brother. In Alabama, we call him Tychicus. I think the proper pronunciation is Tychicus. You'll hear me say Tychicus. That's just the way I was raised to say it, but it's Tychicus. So he's going with Onesimus. By the way, that was a matter of not only they traveled together, but that was practicality. Can you imagine Onesimus, a runaway slave, traveling by himself? That, that would have put him at peril. So he goes with Tychicus uh, and, and has that companion. But they're carrying two letters. One is the letter to the Colossians. The other is the letter that Onesimus is carrying to Philemon, which very seriously, in many situations, would have been his death warrant, very possible. And he's carrying this letter from Paul on his behalf. One is pastoral or teaching, the other is a personal letter that contains some doctrinal stuff we're gonna look at in a minute. All right, let me, let me get into the letter itself. Um, well, I just said that, here we go. Uh, we know Paul's the author, uh, no doubt about that. Um, there's, he's one of the characters in it, uh, personal friend of Philemon. Philemon, the leader of the Christian community there uh, in Colossia. Um, the church meets in his home. He's probably a wealthy man of sorts. He has servants, obviously. Uh, the church meets there. It's a large enough house. Uh, one letter, uh, as I said, is addressed in Paul's written both of them, but one to the church and one, one to Philemon. So the other character is Philemon. Uh, then we have Onesimus. Onesimus is not only the bearer of the letter, but the subject of the letter. Um, by the way, what we know about Onesimus mostly 
is not from what the scripture says here in this short letter. By the way, the letter is only 335 words in the original Greek, 435 in the King James Version. That's interesting. King James has added a lot of words to it. Um, 25 verses. Um, it's a very short letter. But what we know about Onesimus, the speculation about him being a slave or whatever, uh, the runaway part, all of those kinds of things, really comes out of secular history more so than scriptures. Uh, so there's some assumptions being made there. But he's a former, apparently disgruntled slave. I want to key in on that word slave for just a second. In, in that culture, you could be a slave for a variety of reasons. Uh, a, a true slave quite often was somebody that the Roman army had captured from a in country they may have conquered or invaded and brought to Rome. The, the population in Rome was overwhelmingly slave, but some of them were indentured servants, which means I pay a fee or pay back through my servant uh, servitude. Or I remember the parable of the uh, unmerciful servant. Uh, he was thrown in prison till he could pay his debt. That, that's, that's kind of, so there's speculation that Onesimus was not necessarily a slave as in a conquered person, but was through indentured because one of the versions says, um, um, excuse me, drew a blank, bond servant. There we go. Open, my, open up my electronic standard version, ESV, electronic standard version. Uh, but anyway, uh, he's a disgruntled slave. He's now turned into, become a brother in Christ, a personal friend of Paul. Most of all, he's dedicated to Christ. Obviously he is. Jesus changes things in big ways. So you read behind the story, we see a need for Onesimus to make things right. Part of that repentance process, there's a, there's a problem out there, especially with a brother in the Lord. I've got to resolve that problem. That's what he's looking at. Um, sometimes that's very important. We have to make the attempt to right the wrong. Uh, this would not be an easy thing, but it clearly shows his true repentance, his complete change of character. It could cost him his life, his freedom at best. So I want to look uh, now a little bit more as we move through this lesson. Just, just hit the high points of the letter. You, you notice how Paul starts the letters. It's a beautiful way to start it. But he says uh, differently than we read in his other letters. Uh, he, he begins, he's identifying himself as a prisoner for Christ Jesus. In Ephesians it's, and Colossians, he refers to himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. In Philippians, he identifies himself and Timothy as servants for Christ Jesus. Notice the difference. Prisoner, apostle, servant. These are not lofty titles of somebody uh, in, in a position as Paul was known. Uh, he, he's appointed by God as a servant. And, and that's no matter his authority or anything. But he, he's, he's addressing an audience in a way that it looks like so he can identify with that audience in a certain way. So he says, I'm a prisoner. Who's he writing on behalf of? Onesimus, a slave. You see the difference between apostle or servant? It's now prisoner. So it's, it's kind of like a subtle way of identifying with Onesimus. And also draw that later because Paul's going to say, treat him as you would me. So that, that was kind of a key to it. Um, but it, again, it's just a subtle way, it seems, to identifying with Onesimus. So then he, he often does this in his letters. He, he per, per gives a warm, beautiful greeting. He, he commends the church for their love and faith. Oh, I wish we wrote letters. We don't even write letters like that anymore. Do we? we don't even write letters anymore, do we? But can you imagine getting a letter that somebody tells you, I thank my God always when I remember you in prayers because I hear of your love and the faith you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. What a, what a beautiful statement Paul's making there. And he uses that uh, time in that letter for that. Uh, it's just part of his greeting, his customary reminder that they're in his prayers. He even, he even gives that to the Corinthian brothers. When he's getting ready to really lower the boom on him, that's just Paul's nature, the way he does it. But he, he then uh, begins his case on behalf of Onesimus. 
Short letter, but powerful. He does not rationalize or deny any of the wrongdoing on, part, on the part of Onesimus. Uh, the situation is, is clear, probably well known. And, and as with his opening greeting, he again reminds them that he's a prisoner also. Uh, uh, implying that he is a prisoner, so are they. The idea of prisoner also. He makes the personal appeal to Philemon that he is sending Onesimus back to set things right, uh, although he preferred to keep him with him. Okay, so then we see some clear things here about the relationship and his role with Onesimus. He's a child of him, similar to Timothy, uh, no longer useless. I love the play on words there. The name Onesimus means useful. We know that. So now he's no longer useless, but truly useful. Uh, he, he can't keep Onesimus there without Philemon's consent. By the way, that's not only because it's the right thing, that was the legal thing. He knew he was a slave. He knew Philemon owned him, had rights over him. So it was the legal thing to do. Um, and I, I like the statement he makes, perhaps the reason he was departed was for the purpose of Onesimus' salvation and greater worth. Where does that ring a bell in your mind coming from? Maybe you're here for a specific reason. Where would that be? Where in the Old Testament? Come on. That was a question. There's an anticipation of a response. Esther, Esther yeah. Read the book. It's a great book. Okay. <laughs> You've heard that before. Same, same kind of thing. Well, maybe you're here for a reason. This might be the reason. Uh, God doesn't do things accidentally. And then Paul states that Onesimus is more than a bondservant. He's now a brother. That changes everything. Well, one time uh, in basic training, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a drill sergeant and uh, I'm, I'm walking through the squadron area and this young, brand new recruit comes bouncing out the door of the chow hall. Young man does not have his hat on. That is a cardinal sin. That is it, buddy. Your life just ended as you know it. And I jumped dead in the middle of that young man. Oh, I'm screaming and yelling and fussing, slobbering at the mouth and, and, and throwing my book down and talking about, you know, what if I forgot to pay you? And then he stands there, he says, Sar Sergeant Layton, don't you remember me? He was the son of one of our elders back where we had been stationed before. And it's like, <laughs> put your hat on, get out of here. <laughs> Changed everything. I knew the young man. <laughs> All right. So, so Paul says he's, he's, he's your brother. That, that's, that's a strong point. Paul now begins his specific request. Oh. Um, I, I love that statement. Receive him as you would me. What if Paul walked into the building right now? I mean, you guys have honored me. Those of you that have greeted me and met me and, and honored me, thank you for that. And I mean that sincerely. You know, I'm a brother in the Lord, your family. You treat me as such. You honor me. Thank you for that. But, wow, imagine if Paul came in. That's a whole new category. That's almost on par as if Mike Mazzalongo came. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Who? Mike's so important they forgot how to mention or pronounce his name. I had to remind him. No, seriously. Paul says, what if I came? How would you treat me? Treat him that way. That's, that's amazing. So imagine if he, the reception he would have had and, and did receive. Uh, so Paul said, treat him like you would me. And then that statement of charge any wrongdoing to Paul. There's a lot of speculation that maybe Onesimus stole some money, or at the very least some supplies to start his journey with. You know what I think? Dave Layton's opinion? Just the fact that Onesimus ran away is depriving his master of his service. That was theft. Theft of services. So uh, that could have been what he took from him. We don't know. Uh, secular history doesn't say. But make him welcome. Honor him. And whatever, and this is a key to the letter, whatever he owes, charge it to me. Keep that in mind. Paul uh, concludes the statement uh, that uh, he's confident Philemon will do the right thing. All right. It is consistent with Jesus' teachings, what Paul's doing. Uh, I've got the scriptures up there. You, you know these, uh, Matthew 5, 7, uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, the parable of the unmerciful servant. 
Uh, how can you expect mercy if you're not going to show mercy? Um, uh, Matthew 22, 34 through 40, uh, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The greatest is the first commandment. The second like it, love your neighbors yourself. Uh, it, it, further taught by Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan, who's my neighbor? Samaritan? Really? D that despised race? Yep, that's your neighbor. Uh, 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 and, and the, the one other, uh, the teaching in John 15, uh, this is my commandment, you love one another, except slaves, right? No, love one another, whoever that is. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that, it, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You're now my friends if you do what I command you. We sing that great song, I'll be a friend with Jesus. Oh yeah, well do what he commands, that's what it, he expects. It's also consistent with the teachings of Paul, uh, two from Colossians. By the way, uh, uh, Mike and I were talking about this. It, it seems to me that Paul's writing the letter of Colossians in part to prepare them for Philemon's coming. I want you to apply the things in Philemon, to Philemon, excuse me, that I'm talking about here in this letter. So Colossians 3, 13 and 14, uh, bear with one another, forgive one another, above all put on love that binds us together in harmony. Colossians 3, 22 through 25 and also verses 4, 1. Um, bond servants obey their masters as unto the Lord. Masters treat your bond servants fairly, knowing they also have a master in heaven. That's why I'm thinking it was some foundational stuff for Philemon coming to him. And, and uh, that, that's an important point to remember as well. But again, on Onesimus or, or Philemon, confident in your obedience, verse 21. All right, as wonderful as this story is, and it's a great story. It has depth that I did not ever anticipate until again I thought, wait a minute, this is a book in the Bible, specifically in the New Testament. Where's Jesus in this story? And that's when it jumped out at me. I think this story, true story of course, is an allegory. That's why it's in there. It's a, an allegory by definition, a story, a poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning typically a moral or political one, depending on what you're reading. In other words, it's a story with a deeper meaning that has both physical or spiritual implications for our lives. I think that's what this is. And that's why the compilers of the New Testament, the canon said, I think we need to put this in here. This is an important letter. Do you see it? Do you see the story of Jesus in this book? Are we prisoners for the Lord? Oh yeah. Have, have we sinned against our master? Oh yeah. Can we plead ourselves and gain salvation ourselves? No, we had to have an intermediary. Well, what's Paul doing? He's pleading on behalf of Onesimus. You see it? It is the gospel story, all wrapped in one. That, that's what this is all about. Onesimus, he's a lawbreaker. He, he's unable to redeem himself. He has no rights. He's, he's chattel. He, he may not be a slave, 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 but he's, he's, he's in servitude, indentured at, at the very best. He's subject to punishment, even death. Who hung by Jesus on the cross? Who was there? Thieves, right? Onesimus apparently is accused of theft, so it could involve the death penalty. Other punishments, branding, dismemberment, imprisonment, all kinds of things. So he was subject to punishment. There was almost no um, limit on what a master could do to a servant that, that misbehaved in this regard. Uh, 1 John 3 and 4, sin is breaking God's law, so we're guilty of that. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. And Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So there's a tie in here. Um, we as conscious, deliberate sinners have also broken God's law. We're separated from Him. We're separated from our Master. God did not force us to sin. We chose to sin. We ran away from God. God didn't run away from us. So Onesimus, because of his position as a runaway slave, he's helpless, unable to plead for himself. He's subject to punishment, even death. By the way, I already said it, death. 
usually was crucifixion. That's an interesting little tie-in. And, and so we, in similar fashion, we cannot plead ourselves. We're due punishment, even death, as Romans 3.23 stated, or, or 6.23. Uh, we also, because of our guilt and separation, we, we just can't plead for ourselves. We need that intermediary, as scriptures tell us. There's also similarities between Paul and Jesus. Paul, because of his relationship to Philemon and his love for Onesimus, he now pleads for, but also takes on the debt of another. Who took on our debt? Come on, who took on our debt? Our Lord did. So you, you see that relationship, that tie-in. Onesimus, as we've stated, he's subject to and deserving of the death punishment under their law. But uh, Paul, he's guiltless. Paul didn't have any responsibility here, legal responsibility, except to report the situation. Paul didn't have to take on the debt. Paul didn't have to write this letter. He didn't have to plead on Onesimus' part, but he loved Onesimus. He's a brother. He loves Philemon. He wants unity there, so he brings them together. He plays the role of reconciliation of the sinner and the sinless. That's what Paul does. That is exactly what Jesus does. And Paul later in 2 Corinthians would say, we have this ministry of reconciliation. So he not only teaches it, he demonstrates it. That's what this letter is. And Jesus, because of his relationship as the Son of God, without guilt, without sin, specifically because of his love for us, took on our sin and now represents us before our Master. There we go. Whoop, sorry. Technology is great when you have it. There we go. So Jesus took on our debt, represents us before God. I've put some scriptures up there, Romans 8, 34, Hebrews 7, 25, and Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Those are uh, statements from scripture that talks about the Lord uh, interceding on our behalf. Didn't have to, chose to. Remember I said I wanted you to learn from this how much God loves us? How much does God love us? So much that he sent Jesus to die for us? Jesus loves us so much, he died for us, carried through with it. All right, let me conclude in, in the interest of time here. We, we see in this short but powerful lesson the very essence of the gospel. Uh, we can be free from our debt of sin through the love, mercy, and grace of our Lord. Um, real quick, the rest of the story from secular history uh, we don't know from Scripture, but we do know from secular history, Onesimus served as an elder in the church of Ephesus. Well, in order for that to have happened, Philemon had to have forgiven him. And, and not only forgiven him, but made Onesimus now a part of the community of believers in that area. What a beautiful story. I love the painting uh, that came up with this. You, you, and this is how I envisioned it before I even found this picture of Onesimus kneeling before Philemon, holding out the letter, begging for mercy. And, and the greeting, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> um, there is a record of, of uh, Onesimus' death at the hands of Emperor Domitian, but we don't know exactly how. He was either beheaded uh, or stoned to death. We're not sure on how, but uh, he, he, either way, he died as a faithful servant of the Lord, as a, as a shepherd uh, at the Church of Ephesus. All right. What a beautiful letter. Yeah. Slow down and read scripture. Look for the, the theme of this series that you're going through. What's the main meaning behind these? Why is this letter here? Why is this statement here? It's not by accident. It's there to teach us, to encourage us, and, and, and most of all, to strengthen our relationship with the Lord. That's what it's all about. So Paul said we have this ministry of reconciliation. He demonstrated that not only in, in this letter, his actions, but, but throughout his life as a servant to the Lord. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your attention and, and uh, I appreciate your fervor and spirit of serving the Lord. And again, uh, I bring greetings from your church family in Prattville, Alabama. Thank you. <laughs>